Today is Veterans Day 1995. And the reason that I put this in the record is today, according to my rain gauge, in the last 24 hours, we received one inch of rain. And one inch of rain is important when you're going to talk about the hydraulics of Chautauqua Lake. And Chautauqua Lake is a hydraulic system. I've got an awful lot of information that I want to share to you in this very small half hour. Generally speaking, Chautauqua Lake watershed, 180.5 square miles, receives on average 42 inches of rain a year. I shouldn't call it rain, I should call it precipitation because it comes as snow, sleet, mist, and drizzle. But basically we get 42 inches of water. Now, I'm going to go through a mathematical game with you because it's important for you to understand what 42 inches of water means. When you get through with the mathematics of looking at an acre of land, which is 42,360 square feet, and you, you begin to understand what an inch of rain means on that, and when you look at the total watershed of 180.5 square miles, what you're talking about in annual precipitation is 1 trillion 99 billion pounds of water. And the reason I give it to you as pounds is because I want you to understand the magnitude of the energy that is involved as that falls on the watershed and as that reacts within the watershed. The, we've all been taught about the hydrological cycle, but I think that we've got to review it just a little bit again to understand the lake as a hydrological cycle. And the reason that I want you to understand the lake as a hydrological cycle, it'll help you understand some of the manifestations of the lake that we like immensely and other th things that we don't like so much. And realize that it is a product of the hydrological cycle to a certain degree. Uh, off on the bulletin board over here, I have a, an imagery of a hydrological cycle as uh, idealized, and I'd like to look at that for a moment and uh, have us uh, understand what is taking place. So over here is an idealized picture. You get your annual precipitation onto the ground, and it either runs off, runs into the lake, or percolates down through the soil, or the vegetation of the area on which the precipitation falls is going to catch it and hold it. And so there are several things that we've got to look at when we look at that 42 inches of annual precipitation. Part of it is intercepted by everything that is growing in the watershed. And part of it is intercepted by just the surfaces it lands on. And so somewhere between 25 and 35 percent of the annual precipitation immediately returns to the atmosphere either as transpiration or evaporation within the watershed. The remainder of it comes as runoff or percolates down into the ground. About 5 to 15 percent of that precipitation is going to go into the groundwater system, but it will eventually flow out into the uh, Chautauqua Lake. Keep that in the back of your mind. I realize you probably saw it in the fifth, sixth, or seventh grade, but it's important in order to understand the lake itself. Depending upon the time of year that the annual precipitation falls, you get different types of manifestations. And we're going to look at that in detail in a moment. But there are some things, again, to put in the back of your mind. If we get a snowstorm, depending upon the size of the snow particle, uh, how cold it is, we could get, in one inch of precipitation, we could get as much as 10 inches, or under some very extreme conditions, maybe 15 to 20 inches of snow, but only get one inch of moisture. Nominally, they figure a foot of snow may equalize an inch of precipitation. Over the years, uh, I have done snow measurements 
In some instances, such as 1976, the reason for the snow measurement was to alert the people that we were going to have a spring flood. That particular uh, fall, winter, and spring, we ended up in February with between five and six inches of water in the snowpack, even though the snowpack up above Mayville was 43 inches deep and the snowpack down along the Maple uh, Golf Course, Maple Hills Golf Course, uh, was only six inches deep. However, that six inches of snow was almost solid water. Uh, and it was just waiting to melt. And we've got to understand that that plays a role in, in what happens. And historically, it plays a role because it gives us our spring freshet that allowed the early uh, transportation of goods and services out of the Chautauqua Lake watershed. The watershed of 180.5 square miles catches this precipitation and then transports, depending upon what numbers game you'd like to use, anywhere from 45 to 65 percent of it to the lake. Realize as these billions of pounds of water move down across the watershed, they dissolve chemicals, they help rot vegetation, and they carry materials and chemistry of the watershed into the lake. And it must be remembered that these are not necessarily man-made phenomena. They're part of the natural system. And therefore, Chautauqua Lake is a very rich lake. How rich? Well, if we look at the Great Lakes Basin, every surface acre of the Great Lakes has somewhere between two and three and a half acres of watershed for every surface acre of the lake. Where in Chautauqua Lake, for every 7.8 acres of watershed, we have an acre of surface area. Therefore, we have an even greater opportunity for just the natural hydrological system to carry nutrient loading to Chautauqua Lake. That's not to excuse man for some of the things that he's done in the watershed, but for you to understand how important the hydrological system is to the manifestation that you find in the watershed. The other things that we should understand is that while the upper lake basin and the lower lake basin are split 52 to 48 percent in terms of the surface area of the lake, the upper lake holds 72 percent of the water of the lake. Only 28 percent of it is in the lower half of the lake. Also to be remembered is the fact that the upper lake has a and this is, this is a, a twirl. It has a, a mean depth of 26 feet, an average depth of 35 feet, while the lower lake has a mean depth of 11 feet and a maximum depth of only 20 feet, whereas the upper lake has a maximum depth of about 77 feet. There are some maps that show greater depths, but I can tell you that in the work that, that we have done on the lake over the years, uh, we have not been able to find the 90-foot depth that was recorded on one of the maps that's still displayed on some of the walls of Chautauqua County. By the way, this presentation is based upon a series of documents, and I should give credit to them. We start out with the Corps of Engineers report in the early 1940s, then their early 1950s report. And interestingly enough, in the early 1940s, the Corps of Engineers said the best way to prevent flooding around the shores of Chautauqua Lake was to not build in the normal floodplain. Hmm, how logical can you get? Uh, by 1952, we'd had enough people build in the normal floodplain that they were calling for relief uh, from the floods. And the Corps of Engineers created a wonderful uh, proposal where they were going to take the surplus water and drain them up through the Continental Divide and into Little Chautauqua Creek and down into Lake Erie. Someday, if you want to get involved in that, we can spend a whole, a whole half hour on the 1952 Corps of Engineers proposal. We also have the Harvey Report, which was done by an engineer by the name of Harvey from Nussbaumer, Clark, and Velzey for the state of New York, dealing with whether or not there should be any further dredging in the lake. Um, we also have the Allegheny River Basin Report of 1972, which gave us a lake management scheme and a, man a manner in which to operate Warner Dam 
uh, to the advantage of, of reducing flooding and maintaining the best possible summer lake elevation for recreation purposes. We then also have the benchmark studies, which was a series of studies financed uh, or encouraged by the uh, Chautauqua County government, particularly Joseph Jirasi, the county executive at that time, and then the 1989, 88, and 89 study dealing with the aquatic vegetation of Chautauqua Lake. Things that we have to be understanding about is, is the whole complexity of, of the watershed. And while I have mentioned depths and dimensions and capacities of various parts of the watershed, uh, I'm going to repeat them because I think it's important that you have them in mind. 72% of the water of Chautauqua Lake is in the upper lake, 28% in the lower lake. The maximum depth of the lower lake is 20 feet. The other parts of the lake, uh, maximum depth is 70 to 75 feet, depending upon whose dimensions do you use. Uh, the reason I repeat those things is that when we begin to look at the lake as a biological system, those are going to be important to remember. Maximum depth of 20 feet in the lower lake, average depth of 11 feet. Um, we'll get into that in, in greater detail. The other thing that we need to know about and need to understand is how the waters of the lake flow out of the lake. We have never done any real measuring of current because I don't know that we can perceive that. But I would like to take you to a, a chart on the back of the wall and, and look at the Shattuckoin River as it courses uh, through the city of Jamestown. And in that, we will be able to understand something about why the lake flows in the manner that it does. So if we can move back to that now. And I'm doing this Chinese, as somebody has su suggested. But what I'm doing is I'm going from east to west uh, through the Shattuckoin River. The Shattuckoin River runs for a total of 36,000 feet uh, through the city of Jamestown. And it starts about seven, the outlet per se starts about 7,000 feet uh, east of Dunham Avenue and Celeron. This line is the bottom of the river. And you'll notice that it's flat. And then all of a sudden, it, it rises a bit and then flats out again. And if you can catch this yellow line, that yellow line is an elevation of 1,300 feet above mean sea level. This line up here is 1,308 feet above mean sea level and 1,310 feet above mean sea level. So this gives you an idea as you go down the Shattuckoin River and begin to approach the Third Street Bridge that the bottom of the Shattuckoin is coming up. And what we have here is the manifestation that I mentioned in an earlier segment of shale bottom at an elevation which is 1,302.5 feet above mean sea level. Then we come down to the sill of Warner Dam, and the Shattuckoin River then proceeds to f flow downhill some 50 plus feet to the corporate limit at Dow Street. It's important that you understand that this exists because this is the throat that controls how waters flow out of Chautauqua Lake. Unless you understand this, you won't understand the frustrations that we will talk about later when we talk about flooding. The channel gets shallower and shallower. And historically, I would tell you that the channel also gets narrower and narrower until you travel down. Uh, on Foot Avenue and by the hospital and uh, go across the river and you realize that it flows under a building and it's only about 20 feet wide. Uh, many years ago I had, when Bill Parmet worked with me, I had him do a study of what the Holland Land Company felt the Shattuckoin River looked like when they did the uh, survey back at the turn of the century. And we estimate that the width of the Shattuckoin today, or the valley that it's allowed to, to move in, is somewhere between a quarter and a third of what it originally was uh, before a European man started channeling the river. When we get involved with the annual precipitation, we have to look at how it falls, and when it falls, and with what intensity it falls. 
And I have another illustration behind me that will help us understand that. And if I can move up to that illustration now. This illustration is a water year. Uh, for some reason, hydrologists use something other than a calendar year. So at the beginning here is the 1st of October, and at the other end is the last day of September. And what we have in the top row is the daily precipitation. The next two lines uh, deal with high and low temperatures during the winter months. Then we come down to the elevation of the lake as normal and cast upon it. In green, we have the flow going out of the Shattuckoin River. And in red, we have the lake elevation as it was taken on a daily basis. And then down below in blue, we have the snowpack that exists in the watershed. You will note that we get a very flat lake elevation and, relatively speaking, a flat flow line in the lake. Realize that in most years, sometime in April, the Shattuckoin River Warner Dam is closed, except when we have peak happenings or rainstorms. And this is necessary in order to maintain the summer lake elevation. In the early 1970s, with the Allegheny River Basin Board, we went into a planning program to look at Chautauqua Lake. And based on the recommendations that were made by previous Corps of Engineers reports, they said that there should be a lake management scheme. There is some way in which we must be responsive to what is happening, and that we can lower the incidence of flooding and maybe keep the lake elevation up so that it's of more use to us. So that is what has happened. And what you find here, this happens to be the water year of 1977, the first year that we put in place the recommendations by the Allegheny River Basin Board as to how we should manage uh, the water level of Chautauqua Lake to get the best advantage in terms of flood protection and the best uh, protection in terms of uh, having a recreational lake level. There's one other thing that should be understood, and that is what the restriction that I showed you a few minutes earlier means to us. And on another chart, uh, over on the easel, I have some dates and some elevations. And I would like to take you to those dates and those elevations so that you can see how long it takes to draw one foot of elevation off of Chautauqua Lake. So if we can now scan over to the easel over here. In 1981, 1980, we had a public meeting on the operation of the dam and what we were doing. And one of the things that was displayed was this set of information. And this is the record of lake drawdown with maximum outflows. Maximum outflows are when the gates of Warner Dam are not restricting flow at all. With a lake elevation at 1310 and no precipitation, we can draw the lake down one foot in six days. In uh, 1978, with 8 tenths of an inch of precipitation and three days with a temperature above 32 and the lake elevation at 1307, it took us 35 days to draw a foot of elevation off of the lake. So that gives you an idea of the restrictive character that the channel gives us. And that's why I included the weather as it happened during that particular time. Once you understand that, you understand why the lake program suggests that we begin to draw the water elevation on the lake down sometime in November and attempt to draw it down continually. And as the water elevation drops, the ability to lower the lake elevation diminishes. It's a very important factor to keep in the back of your mind. I now would like to go back over to the other chart uh, and run through some of the things that it illustrates for the year 1977. One of the problems that we have when we use this table 
is that the flow information is registered at Dow Street, which means that it's all the way at the eastern line of the city of Jamestown. And therefore, we get 10 square miles of urban runoff in our figures that are the city of Jamestown. But let's look at this. We start here in October, all right? And we go through to this point where we have this very high peak, which is March 20th. And if you look back, you see what happened. We had a snowpack that disappeared and flowed into the river, brought the, the river flow up, and also brought the lake flow up. And time after time, we can find the correlation between this particular curve and the elevation of the lake, and again, to substantiate the numbers that I just gave you a few minutes ago. When we get to the summer months, uh, this is five, so this is May. This is the beginning of May. And we carry through here while we have a couple of rain episodes. Um, this carries you on through September. You can see that the flow down the Shattuckland River is restricted until you get these sharp peaks. But if you look up all the way at the top, you see that this particular day, we had two and nine tenths inches of rain. So you get a combination of the water coming in onto the lake as well as the urban runoff. But notice what happens to the lake elevation. Even though you get those gigantic uh, that amount of rain and several days later you get three inches of rain, you don't get a dynamic increase in the elevation of the lake until you get into the uh, latter part of September. The vegetation during this time of year is absorbing and transpiring or creating enough surface space so that you get evaporation and we're not getting that water uh, to the lake and that's typical of what happens during this time of year. This time of year we keep the dam closed or keep it flowing as little as possible in order to maintain the lake elevation. So what happens is when we look at the lower half of the lake with a maximum depth of 20 feet, an average depth of 11 feet, what we have is a very, very shallow pond. And this very shallow pond, uh, that's terrible to call it a pond, it's a beautiful lake. But this very shallow body of water is now penetrated by almost all of the light that is visible. And that has a very important implication uh, when we look at the rooted aquatics later on uh, in another presentation. I would like to sit back down again so I can wrestle with some of the material that's on my table here. Another thing that we ought to be interested in, and it comes from the Corps of Engineers report of the early 1950s, is the maximum possible storm that we could have on Chautauqua Lake. It would be a, in, and in its watershed, it would be a summer type storm in which there would be 23.2 inches of rain falling in a 36 hour period. This means that Chautauqua Lake would raise, rise to an average of 1,319 feet. It would flow more than 6,000 cubic feet per second down the Shattercoin River. To give you an example of maximum flow down the Shattercoin River, at bank full, it flows 1,270 cubic feet per second. At that point, we begin to give people in the village of Faulkner fits about what's happening in the water levels in their basement. So these are things that we have to take into consideration as we look at, at what's going to take place or what we want the lake to take place, on the, what things we want to take place on the lake. When we deal with a lake that is that shallow, a lake that we basically restrict the outflow. The lower lake has a w retention time, a hydraulic retention time of 105 days. The upper lake has a retention time of 526 days. Therefore, we can, if we are going to close the Warner Dam down in order to maintain the lake level, what we are doing is we are holding the water there in the lake. And as we get rainstorms and they carry chemistry into the lake, Let's forget that there are human beings in the watershed at all for this model of thinking. We're going to continue to bring chemistry into the lake. 
bringing this chemistry into the lake is going to give us a richer lake. So without man in the watershed, we can look at the lower half of the lake and say that it is always going to be nutrient rich. And that again will get us into the biological uh, system of the lake and we'll leave that for another time. Uh, the other thing to be understood is that we very infrequently get a storm of any consequence that affects the whole lake and its watershed in the same manner. We've had storms that have flooded out uh, the Chautauqua Mall and has been bone dry in Mayville. I've had an instance where I had a two inch rainfall that I measured at my gauge in Mayville and down in, in uh, the city of Jamestown they measured no rain at all. Several years ago, if you remember, Prendergast Creek overflowed its banks and scared everybody out of a, one of the local bistros uh, and moved a couple of house or uh, travel trailers along the Prendergast. Uh, Goose Creek has risen up and smote the people along its banks and nothing has happened in the rest of the watershed. So you have that that takes place. We don't necessarily have two inches of rain all over the watershed at one time. We did once that I know of. That was Tropical Storm Frederick in 1979. Uh, Wanda Gustafson, who's in charge of emergency preparedness, and I sat down and looked at the weather report, and the Pittsburgh Corps of Engineers said, you're going to get three inches of rain. And I looked at uh, our records, and I said to Wanda, hey, three inches of rain's not going to be any problem at all, Wanda. We can go home and sleep. Well, that night at 10.30, Tropical Storm Frederick came up through Chautauqua County. It's the only time we've had a tropical storm come through Chautauqua County. And it, each of the gauging stations in Chautauqua County measured anywhere between 5.8 inches of rain and 6.6 .6 inches of rain. And Chautauqua Lake rose to an elevation of 1310. Why is 1310 important? Because that is mathematically the elevation that we expect in a storm that has a 100-year frequency. And between the 100-year frequency storm and the 500-year frequency storm, there is only one 0.1 foot of difference, so that the basin and the size of the lake itself acts as a big cushioning hydraulic system for us. But we shouldn't build in the normal floodplain of the lake. And it isn't until 1969 with the federal flood insurance that we finally get the building inspectors to, I shouldn't, shouldn't put it on the building inspectors, we finally get the local governments around the lake to pass ordinances to keep people from building in the normal floodplain of the lake. Before that, each year, the cost of flooding increased a little bit each time. And then, of course, in 1976, we introduced the new uh, lake management scheme, which, by the way, has been in place now since 1976. And I've asked several times that there be public hearings held on it and see if it's doing what we really want it to do. And if not, that we should retune it a little bit. Realize that with the ma manner in which we are now handling the lake, we are sustaining uh, some shore erosion that historically we wouldn't see because it was not unusual in the summer months. I have family pictures from my wife's side of my family where the lake elevation in July could very well have been down at 1306 in July. Uh, I've seen places with uh, annual plants growing on them in family historic pictures that I have never seen dry. But historically, they were dry uh, when the Chautauqua Lake was used basically as an industrial water pool. And it was no longer used as a transportation resource. And there's where we stop at this point. And our next presentation is going to be on Chautauqua Lake as a biological system. And in order to appreciate the presentation of the biological system, you're going to have to remember some of the things that I've given you about the hydrological system. Uh, it's a challenge. Uh, there's a lot of reference material out there. If you're interested, uh, consult the Chautauqua County Department of Planning for the information. Good day. We're going to have a very interesting, very short session here. It's short because we're going to go through it so fast it'll last a half hour, however. For those of you that have not, did not see the last presentation on Chautauqua Lake as a hydrological system, 
I would strongly recommend that you go to the County Department of Planning and Development and get this handout that I created in 1980 uh, dealing with the lake level of Chautauqua Lake. It'll help you understand how it works, but it doesn't have all of the details of the previous presentation. The first really good record of Chautauqua Lake as a biological system is done in 1936-37 and reported in the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation Annual Report of 1938. It's entitled the Biological Survey of the Allegheny and Chemung Watershed. And within it is the first real good set of records about what Chautauqua Lake is. And believe it or not, in 1938, there was aquatic rooted vegetation in the lake that bothered people. There was algae in the lake that bothered people. The fact of the matter is that the Board of Supervisors appropriated its first money to fight the unhealthy conditions in Chautauqua Lake in the year 1934. Uh, we also have in the historic record rules and regulations that the Board of Supervisors passed uh, dealing with the fishery of the lake before the lake took over that responsibility of maintaining uh, the fishery. Chautauqua Lake has been studied by teams of people. I would tell you that Andrew Goodell, who is now the county executive, at one point was hired by the Lake Association as part of a team to study the rooted aquatic vegetation around the shores of the lake when he was either in late high school or early, early university. Uh, we have the Lake Association that has done some uh, rather specific studies, one of them particularly in 1988-89, uh, dealing with certain parts of the lake. Uh, and they went back in and did some very interesting and important documentation on the dating of the chemistry that had been used in the lake over the various years. After the 1938 study, however, there were no more studies done on the lake until the early 70s when uh, we began what is now called, or I call, the benchmark studies, in which, uh, with the help of the Resource Center at the State University College of Fredonia and the uh, Biology Department at Jamestown uh, Community College, we began to look at what was happening in Chautauqua Lake. Uh, why were we looking at it? Because the lake was becoming offensive to us. We didn't like what was happening on the lake. And we began to record certain things. As an example, I can remember uh, Mr. Johnson, professor at, at uh, JCC, reporting on the phenol content of the lake and how uh, Chautauqua Lake was like a big sugaring pan. As you went further and further downstream, the phenol content got higher and higher and higher in the waters, which would be natural, actually. Uh, we then began to look at the fish. We began to look at the littoral zone. The littoral zone of the lake is that part of the lake that is really the most uh, fertile and the most active part of the lake in which we have uh, the rooted aquatics. Realize that we have all kinds of little creatures floating throughout the lake. By the way, before I go any further, if you really want to have a fun, interesting evening sometime in the summer on a night when the lake is absolutely flat, go out on somebody's dock with a flashlight and hold it about two inches above the surface of the water and turn it on and be willing to sit there and watch what happens in the beam of that light for the next 15 minutes. Then you'll begin to understand Chautauqua Lake as a biological system. I'm not going to explain it to you or describe it to you. You go do it and have a very interesting time. In the studies of the 70s and in the studies of 1988 and 1989, we went out and did a number of things. Some of the things that we found about the lake are as follows. There is no thermocline in the lake except under very unusual conditions in the summer months. The, the lake and the surface of the lake and the wind direction and prevailing winds are such that the lake is continually being turned over so that there is no place where you say you have temperature and oxygen to here and down here you have cooler temperatures and you have no oxygen. Once in a while that happens in the very, very deep, but that's only after you've had weeks of no wind uh, of any type on the lake itself. Man has introduced things into the lake. 
something called Potomagetan crispus, something called milfoil, something called German brown trout, uh, something called pike, which also is called walleye, uh, goldfish. There's a number of creatures that we have added to the lake, and there are numbers of creatures that have left. Uh, Bruce Crandall, who is a friend of mine and a fishing buddy at times, talks about the, when, 1940, he was fishing off of the then <coughs> dump at Chautauqua, and he caught a billed catfish. I have not seen a billed catfish in some 40 years of fishing Chautauqua Lake, but he s insists that he landed a billed catfish uh, in 1940 on the lake. So we've seen those types of subtle changes take place. The most dynamic change that has taken place on the lake is the character and the quality of the watershed. Uh, in earlier presentations and in later presentations, we've hinted at the fact that the watershed was basically stripped of its uh, first forests, and it has now replenished itself. I would also tell you that such things as the Agricultural Act of 1985 has taken place, and that had a dairy buyout, and the number of dairy cows that are in the watershed, and the total number of acres that are plowed in the watershed have dynamically changed over the years, so that the change has taken place along with uh, the land use. We've also had a change in the opportunity or in nutrient reaching the lake. Uh, one of the most dynamic things that happened on the lake in terms of uh, its biological system and its change uh, was that in 1975, the Chautauqua Malted Plant, the village of Mayville, closed down. It opened again several years later for a very short period of time, but under different technology. But when we measured the nutrient loading in the little inlet, which drains the site of the uh, state highway garage and the milk plant, and at one point a pickle plant, uh, we found that 28% of the phosphorus loading of Chautauqua Lake was coming out of the little inlet. And the following year, after the close down of that plant, the milfoil community in the upper end of the lake changed totally. In fact, it, it collapsed is about the best way I can describe it because I wrote it up and sent it up to the resource center. Well, let's look at the lake for a few minutes and the things that are happening in it. The richest part of the lake is from the depth of two feet, I'm sorry, the depth of two meters to the depth of four meters. And the things that are going on in there are absolutely amazing. If you could go down in some kind of a submersible and see all of the plant and animal activity and the predation and the exchange of energy that is taking place, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a monumental happening. When we were looking at how weeds, aquatic vegetation, were bothering the people, uh, we decided to see what they looked like in terms of total number. And we did a series of studies in the early 70s and again in 1988 and 89. Uh, there is a map to my right uh, that I would show you just for a moment so that you can get an idea of what we did. We divided the lake up into some 32 sectors and put a sampling team out in each of the sectors around the shores of the lake. And then, along with other information, uh, began to look at it as a fishery resource and uh, what we should do and how we could impact uh, the aquatic vegetation so that we could use the lake in a better manner than uh, we've been using it in the past. Uh, this map can be found in your local library. It's uh, part of a two-volume presentation. Uh, <laughs> it's got a terrible title on it. It's the Supplemental Environmental Impact Statement to the New York State Aquatic Vegetative Control Plan a plan for the future use of aquatic herbicides in Chautauqua Lake, dated February 1990, volumes one and volumes two. Each of the libraries in each of the municipalities around the shores of Chautauqua Lake has a set of these documents. And I would encourage anybody that is truly interested in the lake and what is happening on the lake uh, to read these documents. Without this knowledge, uh, it becomes very difficult to enter the debate as to what we should be doing or what we should have done. Realize that uh, at one point we used sodium arsenate in the lake to control the aquatic 
vegetation. At one point we used 2,4-D. At another point we, and I say we because I don't want to point at the Lake Association, they were only doing what the community wanted it to do. Uh, we used Diquat. Uh, for the last two years, we have used no chemicals on the aquatic vegetation in the lake. And of course, there was a moratorium in the year 1988 and 1989. Uh, I want to spend a moment on the Lake Association and also on the Chautauqua Lake Conservancy. Both of these organizations are extremely important to the future of Chautauqua Lake. Uh, I support both of them, and I encourage any and all people that are interested in the lake uh, to support both of them. The Chautauqua Lake Association basically is the non-governmental guardian of the lake in terms of it as an activity area. And without them, uh, the lake would be a very frustrating place indeed. The Chautauqua Lake Conservancy is a group that is looking well down the road in the future of the lake and is, is looking to do things that are subtle, not politically exciting, but deal with the things that need to be done in the lake and its watershed in order to preserve it as a lake that we would enjoy uh, for generations and centuries to come. Back to the biological study of the lake. If you are interested in bass fishing, you want to go to that part of the lake where you have a weed edge or you have a rock bottom and realize that the bottom of the lake uh, contains a number of manifestations based on the way the glaciers uh, receded from the area and the way that we have had erosion take place since then. Should mention erosion. Chautauqua Lake watershed is eroding. The shoreline is eroding. The lake is filling in. But realize what we are talking about on average throughout the lake is probably two hundredths of an inch a year. And based on studies that were done in the mid-1960s on the creation of a watershed program that would have created impoundments to stop siltation into the lake, this was a Public Law 566 financed program where the federal government would have paid most of the cost of what we were going to have to do. We found that we did not have sufficient erosion taking place in the lake in general, typically to go into that type of a program and therefore federal funding was never brought forward. Realize, however, that we can have an instantaneous storm in one of the drainages of the lake that can give us tremendous quantities of erosion at the mouth or at the delta of a particular stream. The logs of the documents that I just showed you will tell you about the numbers and the types of the fish and the change in the fish. Oh got to tell you about another change. There is no doubt that we now have uh, in Chautauqua Lake that little scallop that has frightened everybody in the Great Lakes. The zebra mussel is with us. There is little doubt of it. The question is, what will it do within the, hydro with, within the biological system of the lake? We don't know. I have talked with people that have scraped large quantities of them off of hard surfaces at uh, depths of over six feet. So they are here. What it will mean to the future of the lake, I don't know. If you look at the lake, in the time that I've been here since 1960, we've had new people arrive in the lake. By new people, I mean new fish. Uh, the, the silver bass, which is a, a very interesting uh, fighting little beggar, uh, is now well seated in the lake. The walleye pike, which was not here when I first started courting my wife in the watershed of the lake in 1950 is not here as a permanent resident. The muscalunge population has changed and shifted. Why? We honestly don't know. We have a series of theories. But this we do know, that since we started our studies in 1972, the amount of phosphorus loading in the lake has been lowered substantially. It has been lowered through a number of activities. The first activity was a state law that took phosphorus out of household detergents. Therefore, they didn't go into our dishwashers, into our sewer systems, and then go into the lake. Secondly, we have the watershed of the lake becoming more and more of a forest cover, which holds the decomposition of plant material 
better in the site. Thirdly, farming has changed. Fourthly, we've added tens of millions of dollars of sewer systems. The sewer systems have two roles. They change the health parameters of the lake, and secondly, they change the phosphorus and chemical loading of the lake. The sewer systems that we have serving the shores of Chautauqua Lake today are secondary, advanced secondary, or in the case of the Ch South Chautauqua Lake sewer system, which serves all the way up to Maple Springs, I'm sorry, all the way up to uh, Midway Park, and all the way around to the Bosey School in, in Asheville. The chemistry of that sewage treatment plant and all of those people that live in that area no longer goes into the lake. It goes into the outlet of the lake after secondary treatment. The Mayville plant is advanced secondary. The Chautauqua Institution plant is advanced secondary. The private developments that have taken place, their sewer systems are secondary in character, which means that instead of with a primary plant reducing and holding only 65% of the solids, they're holding 85% of the solids and more of the chemistry. So what we have seen happen also, our knowledge has changed, and this, this is the one that confounds me. When I first got involved with Chautauqua Lake, uh, all of the biologists were telling me that the rooted aquatics take all of their energy and all of their nutrient loading out of the water column. And then all of a sudden, it swung over and they said, no, it, they take most all of their nutrient loading out of the residual uh, siltation in the bottom of the lake, in the mud and the mucks. And now what they're telling me is it depends upon temperature and pH as to whether the rooted aquatic takes it from here or there or from both places at the same time. The fishery generally is healthy. It has changed. It has a different balance in it. What the zebra mussel is going to do, we don't, we, we, we don't have the foggiest idea. The muscalunge is still here, uh, but it's got to be 40 inches long now before you can take it, and that's a lot of fish. Uh, the walleye pike is here, and if there's ever a finer fish, freshwater fish to eat, I don't know um, what it would be, unless you like fillet of perch and are willing to work for fillet of perch or fillet of calico, uh, that's up to you. Basically, the lake is much healthier than it was when I arrived in 1960. It's healthier in terms of the nutrient loading that is going in. In fact, we're now waiting. I'm waiting almost with bated breath uh, for a nutrient budget study that should be released within the next year. One of the last things I did as planning director of the county was to make application to do a new nutrient budget study to find out where the nutrient loading for the lake was coming from. And it's, it's finally been implemented. And two years ago, I assisted as a volunteer and help do a whole new land use study of the watershed of the lake so that I'm confident when I tell you that the watershed is changing in a much more positive manner uh, in terms of the quality of the water in the lake, except for that area between the perimeter roads and the shore of the lake where we have the most intense activity. That's up to you and I as we do things in that area to see to it that we do not add any more nutrient loading to the lake or uh, increase the siltation to the lake. It's, it's one of those things that you and I have to be responsible for. It is a healthy lake. We have a good diversified weed community. It used to be that Potomagee and Crispus and Milfoil absolutely dominated the lake from June to September. Now we understand that Potomagee and Crispus basically gives up its life cycle uh, somewhere in the last weeks of June in the first week or two in July and it goes dormant to the bottom of the lake until late in the fall and then starts growing again. And Milfoil, in talking with the executive director of the Chautauqua Lake Association, he said that the Milfoil content of the weeds that the Lake Association cut this year were the smallest that he can remember or that he can find in the records. So we have dynamically affected the lake and it's evident in what is happening in terms of the rooted aquatics. There is Hadley Bay I believe had some problems uh, this year uh, and one of the things that 
I probably should talk about in another category, but I think I'll talk about it here, is ice and ice cover, because it does affect the biological system. But one of the things that we learned here in Mayville not too many years ago was that the ice off period on Chautauqua Lake is a very vigorous and mechanical time. Uh, we built a permanent pier out into the lake and put out bundles of pilings to protect that pier. And when the ice came off in two years, the bundles of pilings came out and the pier disappeared. The tragedy of that story is that there was nobody here to tell us how forceful when you have square miles of ice and you have a 50 mile an hour wind blowing out, how forceful that sheet of ice can be as it uh, scours the edges of the lake. And I think possibly this is what has happened in Hadley Bay in the, the last year or two. One of our recent ice outs pushed up the uh, material that was, could be affected by, by the ice sheet. Uh, last year was an unusual year. We didn't have the ice cover the lake until well into January, um, which is an unusual happening. This means that the lake temperature didn't get down that cold. It means that the light penetration was there and more available for things that were going on in the lake. Realize that you can have an algae bloom in the middle of the winter under the lake if you get enough nutrient loading coming down uh, out of the watershed. And this is some of the information that the students have given me that were involved with the aquatic vegetative management study and back in the benchmark studies of, of the 70s. Uh, it's a very special place. One of the things that we're going to have to look at very closely, in fact, is how we use our motor fuels on the lake. I'm more and more conscious of the fact that I've got a gas hog and uh, when I run it, I spill an awful lot of gas on the lake, and uh, I, I'm beginning to f almost feel guilty about that. There's another manifestation that has taken place, and I, I get this from my family notes. Uh, maybe some of you read Pat Parker, Apple, Pat Appleyard Parker's column in the, in the uh, Post Journal's uh, Saturday segment, uh, but she kept notes on the uh, mallard duck population on the lake, and. She, she and her sister, my wife, can't remember a large mallard duck population on the lake when they were children. And then we kept some notes over the years and we found that the mallard duck population increased. And the year that I circulated this document, uh, which was in 1980, I did a foot census around the shores of the lake. And that particular year, I estimated that there were 2,500 ducks that lived on or were raised on Chautauqua Lake, um, something that uh, many people don't have any real memory of. Uh, we did some studies, if you remember, when the bridge across Chautauqua Lake was uh, stopped for an environmental impact statement. Uh, we did a waterfowl study then. Uh, we did a waterfowl study uh, as part of the 88, 89 work. And if you would look out in the next couple of weeks on Chautauqua Lake, this is now being taped in November, uh, you would find that the tundra swans are here, the geese are here, the widgeons are here, and if you hit a good day, you may see uh, literally uh, thousands of waterfowl that migrate through and use Chautauqua Lake as a, a uh, stationing position in their migration to the south. Uh, some of them will stay a year, here a year round, and if you get down to the inlet outlet of the lake, you will find in March, which is extremely early, uh, you will find some hen mallards already on nest and in some instances, in some years, already having broods that they are uh, caring for in the outlet of the lake. In terms of the lake as a biological system, it's healthier than it has been, <coughs> pardon me, in decades. Not only is it healthier, uh, it's healthier in and of itself. Uh, we have changed the chemicals that we use in the lake uh, through the work that was done in the aquatic vegetative management plan. 
Uh, we have also changed them because we've begun to understand what the other chemicals that we've used in the past and that they shouldn't be used. Somebody's going to say, John, but that stuff's down there in the bottom of the lake. That's true. Some of the chemistry is locked in the bottom of the lake. And some of it, the only way that it can be release, released and put back into the biological chain, whichever link or web you want to go up, would be to have an absolute lack of oxygen present and a high amount of uh, absolute stagnant conditions. And this does not happen very often. Others of the chemicals, the only way you're going to release them from the bottom clays is to boil them in sulfuric acid. And we're not about to do that in any uh, normal biological system. So I don't see those as, as a a challenge to us at this point. Uh, I see the uh, lake as a biological system being used more as a fishery than it has ever been used before. I'm glad to say that we have some fishing organizations that <coughs> support a catch and release, and that's it. Uh, I think that's good, although I've got to admit that I like a fillet of, of walleye or a fillet of of perch once in a while. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, the uh, fish community, if you want to find it, it's in the weeds. It's also, some of the fish are pelagic. You find them at mid-lake. Sometimes you will find uh, almost any type of uh, creature of the lake in particularly the littoral zone. The littoral zone is not something to be concerned about. However, it does cover about 4,000 acres of, of the lake's 13,000 acres. Most of it is in the lower lake. I'm going to talk to you about Burtis Bay and, and some of the insults that have been given to Burtis Bay uh, at, at a later time when we talk about what we did in the lake between 1860 <coughs> and, and, and World War I because we really, we really did some horrendous things to the lake in the past. We didn't understand, realize that many of the things that we now look at as, as being mistakes, at the time we did them, we didn't think of them as a mistake. We thought them as a logical process. The Indians, of course, were putters and takers. We're not only putters and takers, but we're living on the shore of the lake. As we continue to develop the shore of the lake, We've got to be more sensitive to the biology of the lake as it presently exists. Uh, let's get rid of those fancy fertilizers uh, within the perimeter road area of the lake. Sure, fertilize your lawn. Sure, use weed killers, but use them at the lowest possible level possible so that those materials do not wash into the lake and do not affect what I believe and what many of the people that I've worked with believe is an improving uh, biological system uh, that we can enjoy for many generations to come. We're going to start off today looking at Chautauqua Lake from the years 1860 to World War I. Uh, somebody's going to ask, why did you pick that? those dates? You'll find out as, as we go along why they were picked as, as markers. I think there's something that we ought to review a little bit, and that is the importance of the lake as a transportation system up to the 1860s. Uh, many things were transported down the Erie Canal, up over the Chautauqua Portage, to Chautauqua Lake, to keel boats and rafts, and carried down Chautauqua Lake and down through the river. How do you get down through the river when you have dams on it? Well, the history refers to the fact that there were five locks in the river, and they were maintained for navigational purposes. How important was this uh, part of Chautauqua County's economy at that time and up to about the 1860s? The Chautauqua County Legislature petitioned to have the elections in late May instead of in February and March because of the fact that 
most of the people of Chautauqua County were downriver during those periods of time, either on keel boats or on lumber rafts. Uh, this goes on until 19, 1872 when they changed the law and put the uh, elections back early in the year. But for that period of time from 1811 uh, through to 1872, the spring freshet was extremely important to the economy of Chautauqua County and parts of western New York. Uh, after 1825 and the Erie Canal was completed, product would come through to the canal to Barcelona Harbor, come up the uh, portage, be uh, transferred to a keel boat or a raft, and taken down lake and down through a series of locks. There is no evidence of the lock system anymore. And if you go down Foot Avenue and go by the old uh, Crescent Tool Plant, you'll see how limited the river has been constricted to uh, in, quote, modern times. 1860, why is that picked? 1860 is picked as a benchmark time in the history of the lake because that's when the railroads reach Jamestown. Railroads reached uh, the northern end of the county in the 50s, 1850s that is, uh, but they did not reach Jamestown until 1860. With the opening of the railroad uh, down past Lakewood and, and on westerly, uh, something happened to Chautauqua County. Things began to move and change. 1867 and 1868 uh, finds a railroad coming from Cory past Mayville, or through Mayville, depending upon interpretation, uh, to Brockton. And all of a sudden, Chautauqua County is open to the world, and Chautauqua Lake is open to the world. The lake basically was a transportation route, and it was a fishing place. And of course, the people of the county, if they had spare time, recreated on it. But it's the coming of the railroads, and all of a sudden, something dynamic happens on and around Chautauqua Lake. And over on the easel, I have three documents that I would strongly uh, recommend to anybody that's interested in the, the, the love and enjoyment of this period of time. It's three publications put together uh, and published and sponsored by the Fenton Historical Society, and those documents are available from Fenton. I don't know that they're available in bookstores, but you can get them from the Fenton Historical Society uh, in Jamestown. And they record this happy uh, time, this time from uh, 1860 to about 1930 when exciting things are happening on the lake. Uh, the peak period is 1880 uh, to 05 give you an idea of what I mean by that in terms of uh, activity. Uh, if they would go back to the easel and look at the, the table in the graph that's up there, I took the information out of the uh, steamer book and tried to plot the boats that were plying Chautauqua Lake. The upper table uh, shows the small vessels and the maximum number of small vessels that at any time on the lake were 12. The maximum number of large vessels, which is the lower table, uh, you're, you're dealing with nine. Uh, so at some point, we have 20 boats zooming up and down the lake, uh, carrying people all over the place. And this goes on until 1886, when uh, entrepreneurs of Jamestown decide that it's time to create a railroad system up the east side of the lake. And by 1888, we have a railroad from Jamestown uh, to Mayville. And this cuts in a little bit on the, on the boat traffic, uh, but not that much. Uh, we have hotels that uh, come up like mushrooms, so to speak, uh, in Bemis Point. Uh, particularly, Lakewood particularly. 1887-88, the railroads come to Mayville, and in 1888, we have a hotel. The first hotel 
that is built specifically related to the railroad lake industry. The first hotel, however, on the lake was established in uh, the 1830s at Fluvanna. It was the Fluvanna House, and it was a, a facility of long life uh, and service. It was a hunt club, in part, uh, in its original establishment. Anyway, we begin to get into this, this wonderful period of time of, of boats going up and down the lake and racing here and there. Uh, we could get a railroad out to Asheville long about the turn of the century. Along with the railroads, we also get an exploding new industry for Chautauqua County. It's called ice harvest. And we begin to see an industry that blooms at a number of points on the lake, all related to the railroad systems, of course. Uh, Lakewood, Mayville in particular, are the focal points of this industry. And this industry flourishes until about 1895 when we get uh, commercial scale refrigeration. And from that point on, the ice industry begins to take on a different character and it's finally, uh, it finally disappears. If you're interested in the ice industry, uh, there is a publication that was done by Willis Rothra, a small but wonderful book uh, on the ice industry on Chautauqua Lake, and I recommend it to you highly. Uh, where it is in terms of availability and sales, I don't know, possibly the Mayville Library. Maybe it's in some of the bookstores. A, this is a time of churning and change and change give you an idea. Vulcanization of rubber, the automobile, 1904. We have a couple of guys called Wright that are flying. Um, we get our first federal aid to highways in 1916, and we've got a, a rolling change that takes place. But if you're really interested in an exciting and romantic time, uh, concerning Chautauqua Lake and where Chautauqua Lake has received its reputation, which lives on uh, to this day. Uh, it's in this period from about 1880 to 1905. This is the peak time, boats, ships. If you want to have some fun I and, and listen to some of the wonderful stories about Chautauqua Lake, uh, Norman Carlson has some beautiful stories about floating islands rock-built islands, boat races, stranding boats, uh, rowing races, uh, and including the fable, or I don't know that it's a fable, but the story of the governor of the state of New York coming to Chautauqua Lake in the early 1880s and being given a ride down the outlet of the lake, and they have somebody in the bottom of the ship, pounding on the bottom of the ship to convince the governor that Chautauqua Lake Outlet ought to be dredged. And uh, along with a lot of other political shenanigans, finally, there is some dredging done on the lake. Uh, that's an interesting uh, story in and of itself, and we might look at it for a moment. Uh, in 18, the late 1880s, state funds were provided to dredge the outlet of the lake from the boat landing out uh, to approximately what we know now as Benita or not as far as Dunham Avenue in the village of Celeron. Over a period of several years, a dredging contract was uh, executed and they took 180,000 cubic yards of material out of the outlet and guess what they did with it? They put it in Burtis Bay the place that really didn't need to be filled in. And then that corporation that owned those, that dredging equipment spent another 10 years on the lake uh, doing dredging and improving the health of the lake. I find no records as to where they put their fill, uh, but we have looked at the question of dredging the lake in modern time, and there's no problem in picking up dredged material. It's the problem of where are you going to be allowed to put it down uh, today. Uh, as an example, when the sea lion was constructed in the 
access to that harbor area was created, uh, there was need for dredging. And finally, the material was hauled up and placed behind the county courthouse and the our clothier building. But it wasn't allowed until uh, some very important tests were made on the, the material that was being moved. Going back to the question of the hotels uh, and the activity on the lake, realize that the lake was basically used during this period of time as a, as a, as a recreation thing, but it was also used as a industrial water supply. And in my family's archives are pictures of chicory growing on the, on the bottom of Chautauqua Lake in areas that I have never seen dry as early as uh, the middle of July. Uh, so this is one of the things that this boating industry had to deal with. And if you were to look in the books that I've recommended that you read, particularly the one on the steamboats and the hotels, you'll notice that there's one picture showing a dock running out from the end of Dunham Avenue to the, quote, middle of the lake and the trolley tracks running out to that point to load steamboats. And the literature suggests that the reason that people came to that point was they didn't want to ride the long trip in the outlet to get out uh, onto the lake, that they would uh, get on one of the uh, trams or electric cars uh, and go to Celeron and get on the ship. Uh, I have a sneaking suspicion that it could also very well have been that the outlet was uh, rather low and maybe those boats didn't want to go out fully loaded uh, until they got to Celeron. Uh, I'm going to have to chase that idea a little bit further, but I think there, that may have also played a role in the people going to Celeron uh, to get on the various ships to go to the various places. For years, uh, people were transported from either Mayville or uh, Lakewood or, or uh, Jamestown by boat to the resorts around the shores of the lake. There really is no dynamic development on the lake. Uh, and I'll show you a map in a few moments. Uh, about how the lake looked about the turn of the century in terms of development. Uh, probably the, the biggest development that took place about the turn of the century was the development of Oriental Park. And in the county clerk's office, there is a record showing the, the promenade, the horse bridle path, and the fact that if you sank a well any place in Oriental Park, your well was probably artesian. I'd like to show you the uh, 1904 USGS map. Uh, it's going to be difficult, but I'd like to show you the development that was on the lake at approximately the turn of the century. It's very limited. About seven miles of the 42 miles of the lake are developed at this point. We come out into to Celeron. Here's British Bay. That's where they dumped all that soil. Here's what the village of Lakewood looked like. If you're familiar with Viewcoat, which is a thriving uh, development at this point, you'll notice that on this map, it's designated as swamp. And it's got to be awfully wet to be designated swamp on this map. Then you see that Cheney's Point was an offloading point, And we come up lake. Of course, we had the ferry running back and forth. The first real ship on the lake that's been here forever was the ferry started in 1811. And then we come up to Point uh, to Chautauqua, to Point Chautauqua. There's nothing in the Hartfield Inlet area. It's all designated as swamp on this particular map. And you come down and you can see how close to the shore of the lake uh, the railroad on the east side of the lake courses. This, of course, does not give you the detail, but in some instances, they actually filled into the lake. Bemis Point was not was developed. Oriental Park was not shown as having any development when this base map information was collected. And then you have the point Stockholm and the Griffiths area and Flavana and Bonita. About seven miles 
of the shoreline of the lake were developed at that time to any intensity. We'll look at the lake in the map behind me that was done in uh, 1954, and we'll see the difference in the pattern. And in a later session, we'll look at some aerial photography that shows the development as it existed in uh, April and May of this year. At this time, up through to World War I, Warner Dam, to the best of my ability to, to, to figure it out, is a combination timber, earth-filled, over-the-top flow dam. And if they wanted to lower water, they took a board out of the top of the dam. But in many instances, most of the water was conserved to go to the various industries that were using it downstream. And if you look at the early maps and some of the property descriptions, you can see a number of channels that the, uh, or canals that uh, were built to channel the water of the outlet. Realize that one of the things that our predecessors totally misunderstood was the hydraulics of the lake. They did not understand uh, except when the lake waters got so low uh, that uh, the lake can't supply water on a year-round basis for most of the industry that was in the uh, Shattercoin Valley uh, up through possibly the turn of the century. After that time, the interests in, in water uses changed. Uh, by this time, they'd gone to other sources of power in most instances. We don't really get people concerned about or complaining about high water on the lake, other than, of course, the original incident with uh, James Prendergast and the flooding in 1811, until uh, 1913 and 1918, uh, when we had floods that reached an elevation, lake elevation of approximately 1313. Uh, for reference, the average or the summer lake elevation that we like to think of for Chautauqua Lake is 1308. So we're talking about a lake rise of five feet. Uh, in both instances, these are associated with the spring freshet. And we'll talk more about the spring freshet in, in, in later sessions also. Uh, the other thing that is happening is as this development is taking place is that we're not paying any attention to waste disposal. And in a 1938, whoop, that, getting a little bit ahead, but I'm going to mention it anyway. In 1938, the New York State Department of Conservation comments that the flotsam and jetsam being blown off of the dump at Chautauqua Institution uh, sometimes carries as much as two miles away from the lake. Uh, I can tell you that there was a dump that was still open on the lake and being annually bulldozed into the lake as late as 1962. That was not Chautauqua Institution, however. But we didn't view the lake uh, as something that we apparently spent much time in. I, I, I want, should really go back or have somebody go back and talk about the fashion and the acceptability of swimming in general as a, as a social activity. Um, and I don't think it had the, the, the charm and the, the joy and the desire for it uh, that we have these days. The people around the lake uh, during this period of time uh, are having a problem with the fish and what is happening to the fish. If you are interested in some of the history of fishing on the lake, uh, the Nortons have compiled a whole series of notes and uh, they record the daily catches that are taken from the lake and put in the fish markets uh, of Jamestown. During this period of time, a number of things happen that drive what is happening on the lake. And I'd, I'd like to mention just a few. If we start in 1860, uh, we have the Besmer uh, paper on how to uh, process steel in a different manner. We have the discovery of oil in the oil industry that has its birth in 1859, and it rolls into the economy of Chautauqua County and into the lake. Realize that in uh, 
that same year, that same period of time, the continental United States fills out to its full 48 state continental dimension, and we have no change in that after that. We, of course, go through the terrible, terrible, bloody Civil War of 1861 to 1865. And then we have the Homestead Act of 1862, which opens the West, where you can homestead land for nothing or pay a dollar and 25 cents an acre for it. This also draws people right straight through Chautauqua County, and we don't see them spending a lot of time here. 1867, a fellow by the name of Nobel gives us dynamite. 1876, the introduction of the steam turbine. AT&T is formed that same year. All of these things are important to what is happening on the lake because it drives the people that are able to have the leisure time uh, to come and use Chautauqua Lake. And this is one of the things that we see in the expansion of interest in the lake, and that is as people do not have to work day in and day out for uh, subsistence existence, the lake becomes more and more attractive to people. The Thomas Edison's theory on electrical generation is of extreme importance to us. It comes to us in about 1884, and by uh, 1902, uh, we begin to have the electric cars uh, replacing the animal-drawn vehicles uh, that were part of the mass transit state uh, system of the, those times. We have a, a very difficult time trying to deal with the agonies of the railroads. Uh, railroads are announced to be built, uh, and it sometimes takes as much as five to 10 years before they actually happen from the time the railroad company is formed. During this period of time, we see a number of entrepreneurs involved with a whole transportation system around the lake. But in the final analysis, the broadheads own it all. Uh, and there's a, a wonderful history that can be uh, read in the, the documents that I've mentioned uh, earlier. The uh, competition is such that by 1925, the railroad running up the east side of the lake, or the west side of the lake, is closed down. That, that took me a little bit beyond World War I, uh, didn't it? Uh, but the heyday of the railroads, the electric lines, and the activity and the use of them uh, goes from about uh, 1913 to uh, about 1925. And then the ridership begins to disappear. Where? Into the automobile, into roads. Realize that there's no good road system around Chautauqua Lake <coughs> until we get into the 1900s. And we don't begin to get pavement <coughs> of any consequence until the 20s. Prior to that, it's <clears throat> muddy spring, just absolute total mud. The people uh, prefer to use the ships. The railroads come down from Mayville to Chautauqua. The railroads come up from Jamestown to Chautauqua to Mayville. There's an electric line all the way into Westfield. <clears throat> I can still talk with people about those types of things. There's still people that remember those things, but uh, not too many of them. And one of the things we've got to do is, is uh, with Devin Taylor and some other people, we've got to get some oral history <coughs> in Chautauqua County uh, before it's too late. Uh, people talking about backing up the hill in their Model T because it won't go up in, in any of the gears in the forward motion. Those are the types of things. Uh, an ice industry that hired literally for months, several months in the winter, hundreds of men uh, and teams to harvest ice from the lake. I'd like you to, to cast back over to the uh, pamphlets, if, if one of you could, and I'd like to show and concentrate on the picture of the hotel at Chautauqua Institution in, in that uh, particular booklet. Uh, to give you an idea of what we're dealing with. This is, this is the hotel that was at Point Chautauqua. Realize that this is one of many of these fantastic wooden palaces that uh, attracted hundreds upon hundreds of people. Some people would come all summer long. 
Uh, there's many pictures in, in this document about them, but I want to give you the, the, the relative size. It's all wood. It's all wood. And of course, this one had a mortgage friction problem and disappeared not too long after it was built. Uh, in fact, most of the hotels tragically ended up being burned. We have two of the hotels of that period still in existence. And you can get the flavor of what the 1800s were like by going uh, to the Anthenaeum at Chautauqua. I can see the women in their gowns and their big, beautiful hats uh, with their handkerchiefs uh, walking along the, the promenade and into the hotel. Or go over to the Lenhart. The Lenhart is the last privately owned hotel. I say that because the Chautauqua Institution Hotel uh, has been completely rebuilt uh, in, in the uh, 1980s with the assistance of the Chautauqua County um, Industrial Agency. But go over to the Lenhart at Bemis Point and look at it. In closing, one of the, the last uh, questions that I raised for this period of time was with all of this activity and all of this changing growth around the lake, how is sewage and waste being disposed of? Uh, I know that at Bemis Point they had wonderful sands and still have wonderful sands, and maybe most of it was discharged to the sands, but I've got to believe uh, that the acceptable method, in fact, if you read the literature as late as the 1950s, uh, dilution was an acceptable solution to pollution. <laughs> wow, that's a good one. Uh, and uh, so they, they didn't care about it. But remember that uh, Thomas Crapper showed up in 1882 and gave us the flush siphon toilet that we know today and gave us a way to use more water to get rid of our human waste. Uh, and it, when we get up into the uh, period after World War I, we'll, we'll discuss some of the challenges that uh, we have in, in dealing with waste disposal and its impact on the lake. Remember that all during this period of time, the watershed of the lake is being intensively used for agricultural purposes. We're learning how to use fertilizers. Uh, we don't really know how to use fertilizers well uh, until the last decade and a half. And uh, with the amount of land that was being plowed and the amount of uh, livestock in the watershed, we had a nice nutrient loading uh, coming into the lake. And we'll talk uh, in a short time uh, about the challenge that, that that gives us. The lake has gone through a transformation. The railroads came. It became a wonderful, attractive tourist place with thousands of people coming, some of them coming for the whole summer. And if you read the literature, you find that some summers were only five weeks long. And normally that winter, there might have been a hotel or two that were lost to fire. Uh, the uh, use of the lake, when you read it, you don't see many pictures of people swimming. You see band concerts, you see parades, uh, you see boating, uh, but you don't see much activity in the water of the lake. Why that is not kept as a record, I don't know. I've got, I've got to believe that uh, people swam in the lake. I know that uh, my wife's grandparents swam in the lake. Uh, I know that they rode across the lake. I know that the, up to World War I, when a motorboat of small type went up the lake, everybody would stand out and watch it because it was such an unusual happening up into World War I. Chautauqua Lake, from World War I to World War II. At the close of World War I, on January 1, 1919, a new Warner Dam is dedicated to the public, built by the state of New York. It's a Tatergate Dam with a sill elevation of 1,300.6 feet above mean sea level. It has a capacity of flowing 6,000 cubic feet per second through its uh, 
three tainter gates. However, the downstream channel capacity of the uh, river is now pegged at about uh, 1,720 cubic feet per second, and the people in uh, Faulkner begin to have basement problems. Uh, so we never are able to use that capacity of, of the dam. And if you remember in, or in, in an earlier presentation, I showed you that above the dam and above the Third Street Bridge, the bottom of the Shadowcoin River comes up to an elevation of 1302.5 feet, and it's a, a, a stone-lined channel uh, that gives us some problems. Uh, I don't know the politics of the creation of the new Warner Dam. Uh, I know that the Warner Dam Association was still given the control of the dam, and one of the things that they were to do was to keep navigable uh, elevations in the outlet of the lake. However, we're, we're, we're coming near the end of the steamboat and the hotel uh, period on Chautauqua Lake, and we're beginning to see a new type of economic impact take place, and that's called second homes. Uh, and second homes mean Chautauqua County people and people from different parts of uh, the region. At one point during this period of time, you could go to a particular place in the lake and say, these folks are from Cory. Uh, these folks are from someplace else. These folks are from Pittsburgh. These folks are from Aliquippa, not just Pittsburgh. And people were attracted and began to build around the shores of the lake. We began to see some interesting uh, land speculations. Uh, I, I mentioned uh, in a previous presentation that Oriental Park was uh, a turn of the century excitement. Uh, Benita was also about that period of time, but that had to do with the railroads running up the east side of the lake. Uh, now we get something called view code, which on the 1904 map is shown as a swamp. Uh, under today's regulations, it would remain a swamp. Uh, but uh, we had an entrepreneur go in there and build some canals. Uh, he lotted it out as if there was public water and sewer and uh, began to sell them off. And at one point, I guess things got so bad that uh, if you bought one, you got a second one free. Whether or not it was as attractive as the first one or not, I, I don't know. But there, there was some interesting and extreme land uh, promotion. But individuals began to come up uh, and uh, build around the lake. Then with the loss of the railroad on the west side of the lake, some of the places where the railroad came very close to the lake, as an example at, at Magnolia, the railroad right-of-way was sold off and cottages were built on it. And uh, later on, when we, when we get to uh, the east side of the lake, we will see that also after World War II. And these are tiny lots. So where do you get your drinking water, and where do you dispose of your waste? And what we have after the creation of Warner Dam is a, an ability to uh, influence the lake. But we don't do anything with that ability. And we get a, a tremendous flood uh, in 1918, which is eh, right there at the close of World War I, uh, that created some very um, uh, impressive problems for some people. As the development takes place, there is no regulation. All health developments, all health and development considerations that take place uh, up until 1965 are under the jurisdiction of the town health officer. Now, uh, how does a town health officer who delivered you as a child recommend and reprimand you when it comes to regulations as it deals with, with health considerations? I can tell you of places built on the lake uh, where two 36-inch vitrified tile were put on end and a bathtub put over the top of them, and the sewage from the house went into that and then out into the lake. I can remember as late as 1972, when my son was still alive, we went down to visit a friend in Asheville Bay. He had bought a house that had been there for several decades. And he says, John, what's the sewage like here? And I says, well, I happen to bring some fluorescein dialogue. Uh, let's see if the, how the sewer works for you. 
So I had my son Tim go into the bathroom and put a quantity of fluorescein dye in the toilet. And then I hollered flush. And the toilet flushed. And then it refilled. And he flushed it a second time. And we're standing out on the shore of the lake going, 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004. And when we hit 1,030, all of a sudden this beautiful fluorescein plume appears in Asheville Bay about 70 feet off the shoreline of the lake. Uh, and that went on, that type of development consideration uh, in tiny lots and places like that, uh, went on uninhibited for all practical purposes until 1965, which of course uh, is after World War II, and we'll get into that in, in more detail later. But this has a, an interesting effect. By 1934, uh, conditions on the lake, the algal blooms on the lake are of such character that they've become concerned as a health issue, and the Chautauqua County Board of Supervisors provides, appropriates its first money to help control uh, the algae conditions, the unhealthy lake conditions is a term that is used. Uh, this work uh, begins, uh, the, uh, the program has the use of 10 tons of copper sulfate towed in 100 pound bags uh, behind the steamers. The first biological study of Chautauqua Lake is completed as part of the Allegheny Chemung watershed in 1937 and reported out by the then uh, New York State Conservation Department. Uh, a very interesting and intriguing book and it gives us a great detail uh, into uh, the information about the lake. It tells us about fish that have already disappeared. It tells us about weed communities that, uh, and how they are and what they are and what they are composed of. And we get the, a first real good uh, write-up on Chautauqua Lake and, and what it is and what is happening in it. Uh, this report says people have talked about the fact that there were walleye pike in the lake, but in their investigation they couldn't find any walleye pike. Uh, they talk about the fact that the paddlefish has disappeared from the lake and several other species. They talk about the introduction of the calico bass, <laughs> the, the black and white uh, calicos. They talk about the introduction of other fish to the lake. They talk about a needing to take the carp out of the lake. And for several years, there was aggressive uh, seining of carp. Uh, some, as, they note uh, 73,000 pounds of carp taken out uh, sometime prior to 1937. The next thing that happens that really gets the people excited is the year 32 through 36, where we have drought years and we also have a, a flood year. And up on the easel, I don't know if we can do a good job of showing it, but up in the uh, corner of the easel is a record of the flooding uh, that was published uh, one year. And we can see, uh, if we can catch it, um, we can see the challenge of, of uh, now it doesn't do too well, but we'll, we'll go over and look at it for a moment. Uh, if I don't get tangled up and drowned in this cord, In 1981, we prepared a document talking about the flooding that took place on the lake. And if you start back here, the, the first good comparable record started in 1913. And you'll see quite an incident of flooding uh, to an elevation above 1310 and even above 1311. Uh, and it goes on. And as you get further and further on into uh, more modern times, there's less and less flooding. Uh, these are important, however because they stimulate a report to the United States Congress by the Corps of Engineers. In 1944, the Corps of Engineers submits to the 77th Congress second session document 685, which is a report on the conditions around Chautauqua Lake. And out of that report comes three very important recommendations that we should widen and deepen the river from the boat landing to Warner Dam, which means they're after that constriction that I noted 
back in 1823 when we had a low water year uh, in a previous presentation. The second thing is that there should be a lake regulation scheme that aggressively we should look at the, the lake as a hydrological system and we should do something about using the dam to help influence lake elevations. Now realize that we're getting more and more people living around the lake and there's more and more leisure time and people are beginning to be unhappy with that low summer lake elevation. Uh, again, looking in my family's wife's archives, I find pictures of docks out into the lake back of Woodland uh, near the Marmar restaurant uh, with dry land that I have never, in the, since I've been coming here in 1950, seen dry. Uh, the lake was still being used uh, up and through World War II, or to World War II, as some type of a uh, industrial water supply. The th next thing that uh, the core document proposed was people don't build in the normal floodplain of the lake. Very simple. Uh, however, most of the communities around the shores of the lake uh, before World War II didn't have any building codes or zoning ordinances or any type of building regulation. And so when somebody came to the, the lake and decided they, they'd build a cottage for the summer, and they equipped it for the summer, and maybe they get used an outhouse. Oh, the good old days in the outhouse. I, I can't help but get that dig in. Uh, I, I can't, I just can't live with it. Uh, I don't care for outhouses. But then all of a sudden, we began to see people that decided that uh, because the roads had improved, hey, let's commute. And so coming up the east side of the lake and the west side of the lake, we begin to see more and more of those summer cottages become year-round places. And now they need a year-round water supply and they need a year-round sewage disposal. There's no regulation that says how you'll get rid of your sewage. <laughs> Boy, you come back to that time and time again, John. Yes, I do. Uh, in the 1930s, uh, we had a, a series of public works programs. And I'm sorry, I don't remember if it was the WPA or the PWA uh, that funded the construction, a, a portion of the cost of the construction of collector systems and sewage plants for the village of Lakewood and the uh, village of Celeron. I can tell you that Ernie Leet uh, was deeply involved with those and when they finally retired the last bond payment uh, for the, the uh, plant, uh, Ernie made a, a big, big thing to do about it because it was an important thing for the lake. There are a series of people through this period of time uh, that are important to the lake. Uh, and I only know a few of them, but I'll mention their name. Al Bettini of the uh, Lake Regions. Uh, Fred Cusimano that was part of that group. Uh, Dan Lincoln and uh, Richard Evans, who were both uh, people that were very much involved with the Chautauqua Lake Association and its survival and its con defining of its continual role. Um, we come up uh, later, and I'm going to mention the name now so I don't miss it at a later point, uh, into to, to the uh, late 80s when we get a fellow named Art Carlson, who's president of Seoul, Save Our Lake Environment, uh, plays an important part. There's a whole series of people. Fred Madison, who brought the county planning process to Chautauqua County. All of these people and, and numbers of others that I've missed uh, are involved and should be looked to and of course, for Ernie Elite, we, we named the Celeron Sewage Treatment Plant in, in, in his memory. And uh, that's an that's a interesting way to have a monument <laughs> dedicated to you. Uh, but it's an exciting time. The plants of the 30s, however, we have to understand what they were. They were primary sewage treatment plants. And a primary sewage treatment plant, if it is working at 100% efficiency, settles out 65% of the solids. That means that 35% of the solids continue through the plant. It takes none of the chemistry out of the water. When they built these sewer systems, the collection systems, uh, 
They didn't tell the people that they couldn't connect their storm drain, their basement drain, and their downspout drains uh, to these sewers. So that when we would get an unusual spring freshet or an unusual spring storm, voila, the plant would end up being surcharged. It would flow at over capacity. And the most that they would do was add additional chlorine uh, to the material going out uh, of the outfall. There was some settlement, but nowhere near 65% uh, of the settlement. The plants and the lines got so surcharged that in some instances, uh, well after World War II, manhole covers would pop off at the lower elevations and the sewage would run raw down the street and, and into Chautauqua Lake. Uh, in a number of instances, uh, maintenance was deferred. I won't point to one system or the other. Uh, it's, in, in, it's history now. Uh, and the side of a manhole next to a ditch would cave in. And that would give us the stormwater from the storm ditch into the manhole and into the sewage plant. Uh, there's, there's a lot of that going on. And people continue to build around the shores of the lake. They continue uh, to watch such things. Victoria Park and Midway Park were founded well before World War one, but realized that they were founded, if, and their, one of their major functions was to create traffic on the railroads going up and down each side of the lake. Uh, and of course, the steamboats uh, ran to them. The peak years for the lake railroads from 1914 to 1924, uh, and after that, uh, we, we watched the Western Railroad in 1926 be closed from Mayville uh, to Asheville, which meant the disappearance of Victoria Park. And uh, I only know of that park as a, as a reference point. I, I don't know it uh, personally, never saw anything uh, dealing with it. Uh, during this period of time, we had fish hatcheries at Bemis Point, Maple Springs, and uh, then, of course, later the creation of the present fish hatchery uh, at Prendergast. The time that we were dealing with basically is a time as, again, people are changing their lifestyle. They are changing the amount of time that they have to spend. The roads are getting better and better. Uh, if you go back to the uh, three documents that I've referenced at earlier times and you look at the pictures in the book on the trolleys of Chautauqua Lake, uh, in those pictures, don't look at the trolleys. Look at the roads that the trolleys are running in. And in many instances, those trolleys, particularly up around this end of the lake, the north end of the lake, are uh, running on rails in the middle of muddy roads that may actually have boardwalks for sidewalks uh, on them. So as these things change, the concept of transportation changes, and we begin to add, realize uh, roads, realize that Chautauqua County government did not get into the road building business or the road responsibility business in terms of a complex system until the 1920s. So that all of the roads were prior to that were town, except for the state roads. And you can have a lot of fun talking to some of the old timers about the state roads and the conditions that they were kept in. Uh, I talked with uh, Clarence Kircher, whose dad uh, was very much involved with Davies uh, in the town of Ellery. And he talks about the snow plowing and, and the problems of coming up and down the roads. Some of the roads in Chautauqua County in those early days, one half of them would be paved. And if you were dry, if it was your half of the road, let's say the right side of the road was paved, and you were driving on the right side of the road, and that was your side, uh, you had the right of way. But another car coming at you, who was supposed to be on the mud side, could drive on the paved side until you got close enough that he then had to get off the road. Those are things that you and I don't uh, have any memory of, and it's some of the things that people refer to as the good old days. Uh, not so. 
As the development takes place around the shores of the lake, realize the following things don't exist. There's no minimum lot size that a house has to be built on. There is no minimum lot dimension that, upon which a house is to be built. There is no regulation as to how far apart a sewage disposal system has to be from a water well, not only on your lot, but on your neighbor's lot. And we find more and more people coming in. Of course, the other thing that starts to complicate things and make summer at Chautauqua Lake more exciting is that in 19, starting in about 1918, home appliances that we know of today and accept is absolutely there. We're just being provided. Uh, in the young people's vocabulary today, there's no such thing as icebox. No one even knows what an ice man is today. Uh, but there was a, a group of people that, of course, no one knows what a milkman is today either. Uh, and those are the types of changes, and they're all playing a role in the Chautauqua Lake. Uh, during this period of time, one of my wife's ancestors is commissioned uh, to do a study on the construction of a bridge at Bemis Point. And there are several proposals that, and oh, just in a couple of years, we'll, we'll have a bridge across Bemis Point. But we got into a problem. You've got a steamer that has a height of what? 50 feet possibly to the top of the mast? How are you going to put a bridge across the lake? You're going to have a drawbridge. You're going to have a swinging bridge. Um, you're going to have a bridge high enough so it doesn't impede the boat traffic. What you're looking at right now is a 1995 uh, aerial photograph of the bridge that we do have over the lake. We have only one steamer on the lake today, but the bridge is, was built high enough so that that steamer could go under it. Uh, but we don't have that. We, we have a ferry. And the ferry takes on different roles, and you can have an awful lot of fun of looking in the Board of Supervisors' records about the county finally taking it over uh, because it's no longer uh, economically feasible to have it run as a private enterprise. The uh, railroad is still running up the, the east side of the lake, uh, but we're getting better and better paved roads, and people are able to uh, plan their trips in such a manner that they don't have uh, any problem with the needing, needing to cross the lake uh, at the ferry. If you wanted to cross the lake at the ferry, you, you paid a fee based on whether or not you were on foot or horseback. Uh, it had a fee for each head of cattle uh, that you might be taking across the lake, or your, your truck or your, your car. Uh, by this time, we're down to very, very few boats left on the lake. They basically disappear with the crash of the 1930s. It wasn't the crash that killed them. <laughs> it, was, it was the automobile that put an end to the boats. Uh, the city of Jamestown, which had several names uh, prior to its final naming as the city of Jamestown, uh, was on the lake in January of 1950. Uh, we have a picture of that in, in, the, in the pamphlets. The, uh, it shows them at Bemis Point. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, this last year I commented, uh, so that it ended up in the paper or on radio or something, about the fact that uh, last year the lake was open until January. Uh, then uh, a lady called me uh, and said, I, I'm going to send you a letter. And she sent me a letter about her trip on the city of Jamestown in 1950 as a girl from the boat landing up to uh, Bemis Point. But that's the city of Jamestown is the last of the big boats. And the little boats have already disappeared. 1946, we get the Gadfly 3, which sadly has disappeared uh, since that time. But I've got to get back keep you before uh, World War II in this presentation. I get wandering off there every once in a while. Uh, as the railroads disappear, 
And as we do our biological studies, some people are beginning to understand that maybe we have a greater responsibility and a greater role uh, that we're going to have to pay, play and pay more attention to the lake. The Lake Association now is the keeper of the lake in, in these years. Uh, things that need to be done on the lake, uh, as an example, the, all of the old steamboat docks were great hazards to navigation. Uh, and they began looking at, at removing those hazards. They actually didn't get removed until after World War II, but they began to look at them because the old pilings were sitting up there and if you uh, weren't conscious of where you were or the water was high, uh, you could tear off a shaft or tear out the bottom of a boat. Uh, if there was flooding and floatsome and jetsome material ended up on the lake, uh, who cleaned it up? Uh, a cooperative effort between the Chautauqua Lake Association and the towns around the shores of Chautauqua Lake. But realize up to and through World War II and until 1965, none of the governments around the shores of Chautauqua Lake are concerned about the development that is taking on around the shores of the lake, except for assessment purposes. Ha ha, more development, more tax base. Good, the tax rate will go down, never happens. Uh, <laughs> but there, there, is, there is very, very little attention. Chautauqua Institution, I don't know how they finance their own sewer system. I don't know if it was done by private subscriptions and by the Chautauqua Utility District or if it was a WPA project or not. I don't know, but there was some concern and there were some people uh, that were beginning to look at what was happening to our lake. Uh, more and more leisure time, more and more boats of various descriptions. Uh, we've, we end up hosting some very interesting sailing regattas and races during this period of time that draw national attention. And I won't go into those details. I would refer you to the three documents that I've mentioned before, the three publications by the Fenton Historical Society that are available from the Fenton Historical Society in Jamestown, which are the steamboats, the hotels, and the trolleys of Chautauqua Lake. I, I recommend them to you highly. We have, an, we have another uh, document out dealing with uh, Mayville by Devin Taylor. We also have a uh, publication out titled The Great White Fleet, and I'm sorry, I don't remember uh, who the author of that is, uh, but I recommend them to you. I also recommend that you read, if you're a real historic buff, that you read Hazeltine's history of uh, the town of Ellicott, because that tells us an awful lot about what is happening on Chautauqua Lake and uh, at the outlet of Chautauqua Lake uh, prior to the, the time that uh, we've just uh, talked about. I think I've run out of gas and run out of information, so. Uh, I ask you to, again, uh, come back and listen again as we talk about our lake, your lake and my lake.